you know, this issue about about how Western governments respond to uh, to Islamisms, because there's all sorts of different uh, Islamisms, is not new. I mean, it's not something that arose in 2014. And even the particular impetus for the Muslim Brotherhood review was not about 2014. I mean, it was it went back to David Cameron's Munich speech um, in uh, in 2009. Uh, and for him and certain of the members of the, of the Tory party went back beyond that um, uh, into a concern uh, that we were not dealing uh, with this particular set of ideological challenges that arise from, from, from Islamism uh, in a particularly coherent way. Um, one of the interesting things, if you go back to, to the 19, 19, 1930s, 1940s, um, and Martin Frampton at, uh, at Queen Mary is about to publish a book on Western responses to Islamism from the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. You will find many of the same issues coming up again and again and again, many of the same discussions inside government about how we respond to this, and then there's a period where everything goes quiet until it all resurfaces again. It's, it's, it is very striking how consistent this has been. Um, there was a man called James Hayworth Dunn, um, who was uh, a rather shadowy character associated with, with, with the British Embassy in Cairo in the 1930s and 1940s, who was actually quite close to Hassan al-Banna, who of course was the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, in that period. And wrote a little pamphlet uh, in 1950 when he moved to the United States to uh, Georgetown on, uh, on Islamism in, uh, in Egypt. I think it's called Political Islam in Egypt. You can find it online. He, he self-published it, which is fascinating because he was there at the foundation. And I remember being uh, being told by a number of Muslim brothers when I was doing the review in 2014 in Jordan and elsewhere, um, uh, when I asked them one of my standard questions, which, uh, when I made, made my, my pitch saying, you know, I'm here to, to, to learn about the Muslim brother, to, to think about how we how our policy uh, has evolved uh, and about how we should go forward. And uh, consistently they would say to me, you know all about it, you bits, uh, because you were there at the foundation. Some people also said that you helped set up the Muslim brother governments helped set up the Muslim Brotherhood. And that goes back to the to the small grant that the Suez Canal Company had given to the Muslim Brotherhood for cultural reasons uh, in the very early 30s, um, after the establishment in 1928. Um, uh, and then I'd get very hostile responses from people like uh, Zaki Beni Ershid, who was the, the head of the, of the Jordanian uh, Brotherhood uh, at the time, uh, about the purpose of the, of the review uh, and what we meant by it. Um, and that was also quite a consistent response from a lot of brothers uh, that I saw. And I, sh I should say, when I did the Brotherhood Review, I visited 13 countries in six months, and together, Charles Farr and I, Charles was doing the domestic part of it. We must have had structured interviews with, uh, with, uh, with 200 uh, people, uh, many Muslim brothers themselves, some Salafis, or government ministers, academics. So there was a whole set. It was a serious, it was a serious business. Um, I remember coming back from Cairo. Actually, I'd been, I'd been to, to, to Amman, uh, Cairo, and Tunis, and I flew back to London from Tunis uh, after seeing uh, uh, Renouchi uh, in 2014 to address a meeting of my colleagues uh, in the Foreign Office, my ambassadorial colleagues. Uh, and I started my remarks by saying, I, 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 I come from Tunis, and before that I was in Cairo. And Cairo, was, I, I said, seemed to me the most, on this particular issue, the most divided place I've ever I've encountered, apart from the Foreign Office. Um, and there was, and still is, I think, a very wide difference of view about how, um, how we in this country, uh, about how Western governments more generally, and you see this in the United States as well, deal with this challenge. And some of this is about understanding what the challenge is. Um, and fundamentally, it is an ideological challenge. I mean, the issue about violence is, is important, uh, and there's an awful lot of nonsense talked about <coughs> about the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, approach to violence in particular, included by a lot of Muslim Brothers, who will say that they've always been a peaceful organisation, which is simply not true. Um, but there's a tendency to see violence, like a lot of these other phenomena, like, 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 like anti-Semitism, misogyny, uh, um, uh, homophobia, and so forth, as epiphenomena. Um, they are actually, in my view, constitutive of an ideology, uh, which goes back to, to the foundation of the Brotherhood. It, it, it's not simply an invention of the Brotherhood. These, these, these themes were present in much, 
in much political discourse in the Middle East from the late 19th century onwards. Um, but it's fundamentally an ideological challenge because Islamism, of all sorts, is, is a set of ideologies, uh, which is an epistemic framing system designed to change the world. Um, <clears throat> and for the Brotherhood, uh, violence from the beginning was always contextual and always tactical. It was very uh, Gramscian. I mean, Gramscian's famous distinction uh, between uh, frontal assaults on states and, and wars of position or maneuver. His criticism of, of, of the Spartacists, uh, 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 Rosa Luxemburg and uh, Lukenicht, for mounting a frontal assault upon the state is something that resonates throughout, throughout Brotherhood history. Essentially, the Brotherhood objective, like the objective of all Islamists, is, is not simply to reconstitute society, but also to take political power and create an Islamic state, what they construe as an Islamic state. Because for them, as in much orthodox Islamic jurisprudence, the state is a religious political entity. The state is the vehicle of salvation. Um, <clears throat> and this, which is something, of course, they share with the Islamic state and, and, and Al-Qaeda, and, and all radicalized uh, uh, and, and more uh, actively violent uh, Islamist movements. Uh, the Brotherhood decided, I think, in the, in the 19... 1960s, uh, famously in, in, in Nasser's jails, uh, that uh, the way to success uh, was through uh, the gradual uh, achievement of normative hegemony within a society rather than the frontal assault, the attempt to take over a state by violence, which had founded uh, in Egypt uh, in the 1950s, in the early 1950s. Um, but, the, but, but those two trends are all of there, there's always a dialectic between them. And we've seen this again in Egypt since 2013 with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the split in the Brotherhood in Egypt into maybe three parts. Uh, one bit of it is the traditional leadership, which by and large is in jail, uh, and others are outside uh, who are constituting or associated with a, a collection of disparate movements, some of whom um, are prepared to use violence now to, to seek to confront and potentially overthrow the state. Groups like Liwa Athaura and Al Hassan which are reproducing in many ways the sort of things that the Brotherhood did in Egypt in the 1940s and early 1950s. Um, <clears throat> the relationship between the Brotherhood and, uh, uh, and, and more uh, theatrically violent groups uh, like the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda is complex. Uh, they criticize each other. Uh, if you read uh, Dabek, uh, you will find articles accusing the Brotherhood of being feeble imitations of Islamists and not prepared to put their, their blood uh, uh, on the line. Uh, and the Brotherhood will criticize uh, the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda for being, for being, uh, for being uh, unproductively violent and so forth. But this all seems to be like the narcissism of small differences. The project, essentially, uh, the, the end state uh, is, is the same. <laughs> And one of the, the great hinges, as we all know, of, of, of this ideology uh, for all Islamist movements is, is Qutb. Um, and Qutb is, is, a, is, a, is a seminal, protean, um, and very powerful figure in all Islamist movements. Um, and it is, it is, it is, it is, it is Qutb's use of, I mean, Qutb's milestone, Ma'an and Fittariq. Uh, cut of uh, uh, milestones uh, is, of course, the foundational text of, 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 of all sorts of Islamisms, particularly, uh, particularly violent Islamism. Um, there's a fantastic interview which you can find on YouTube. Uh, 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 Ahmed Mansour, the, 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 the star Al Jazeera interviewer, uh, who is, is, is usually accused of being associated with the Brotherhood himself, interviews uh, 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 Jolani. Um, uh, of, uh, of what was then Jalak Nusra. Um, and he says to Jalani, uh, he says, look, everything you're doing is basically it's Brotherhood doctrine. Is there, what's the difference? He says, everything you say is, is, is out of Qutb. And there's a bit of an argument about this too in the frame. And there are some differences, but, but by and large that is, that is common. And Jalani says, yeah, actually you're right. Qutb is, is, is essential. We teach Qutb as a foundational text in our schools. And then they, they, they then cut to, to, to a little scene of Mansour sitting in one of, uh, uh, of, of the schools, listening to, 
to the um, uh, to the to the uh, to the lecture expounding on on, on, on the Kutub's doctrine of the Jaili and, and the Hakani. Um, uh, and you can find successive murshids of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, and deputy murshids, people like uh, Aikaf and Hadebi, uh, Mashhur, and um, uh, and Muhammad Habib, who was a deputy who was a deputy murshid until the early two thousands. Uh, uh, on film, uh, uh, praising uh, Qutb in extravagant terms. So this, this, this is, this is, this is. You have to understand this. I mean, this, this is the, the constitute of ideological challenge. Um, I think there has been a tendency in Western, and it's still there, to see Islamism, particularly in its brotherhood variety, as the as the expression of, of an authentic. Uh, uh, perhaps the authentic, um, the authentic expression of, of, a, of, a, of an Arab general will, of a sort of Russo-esque general will. <clears throat> if you look at the, if you look at, 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 at support for the Brotherhood as expressed in elections, it's interesting what you see. Um, uh, and Egypt, of course, is, is, is one of the main test cases. If you think about the elections in Egypt in 2000 and 2012, so January, December, uh, December, January 2012. The Brotherhood got about, the FGP, the Freedom of Justice Party, got uh, about 11 million votes on a voter roll of 52 million. Um, so even at the, at the height of its power, uh, it was gaining about, about around 20% of, uh, of the total vote. So it wasn't a majority, it wasn't even a plurality. If you look at the shorter council elections of the May, I think it was, in 2012, when it looks as if only Islamists participated for various reasons. Uh, Brotherhood candidates got three million votes. Mm -hmm. um, if you then look at polling, which was done in that period by Pew and by Gallup, uh, from 2011 through to the end of 2013, when polling in Egypt became more difficult to conduct because CC had taken over, um, what you see is support for a, a successor, an alternative to the to the Mubarak regime, significant support for the FJP, going about I think to about 40 percent. Uh, by the end of 2011, and then it went off a cliff from the spring of 2012 through to the end of 2013. So you end up in 2013 with something like 80% of the Egyptian population saying that they, 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 they greatly distrusted, partly distrusted or distrusted the Muslim Brotherhood and wanted something else. In that period, the popularity of the army was considered, I mean, the army has always been the most popular institution in, in Egypt since Nasser's days. <coughs> was consistently high. That popular, popularity, by the way, the army has, has come down significantly since then. But what it shows is popular opinion matching what looks to have been the trajectory of the Brotherhood's competence in government between 2011 and 2012 and 2013. Now, the Brotherhood will say, well, they weren't given enough time, but actually they were given quite a lot of time um, uh, if you look at these polling figures, because Egyptians made their mind up, made their minds up quite quickly. That's true that there was external funding for movements like uh, tomorrow, um, but even with external funding, every every demonstration in every Arab state always has some sort of external funding, some hidden funding from somewhere. Uh, and Nasser, neither Nasser nor Mubarak, was able to mobilise the amount of people that, that, that even if you aim off, if you don't accept the, 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 the figures that tomorrow themselves are putting out, the number of people who came out in the streets. So what happened in Egypt was that Egyptian people rejected the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, were they, were they rejecting Islam? Of course, they weren't rejecting Islam, but they were just rejecting the claims of the Brotherhood to represent Islam in, in, as, as a political framing ideology. Um, in Libya, in the 2012 elections, um, the candidates associated with the Islamist militias, the 17 February militias uh, in, in, in Benghazi, and indeed the, the Libyan Islamic, the former Libyan Islamic fighting group uh, people, uh, Bil Hajj, Harati, Arari. Bil Hajj's group got zero seats. Uh, Islamists in general got 17 out of, I think, 100 on the first, 100 seats on the first round. Most of the people who were elected were tribal figures. They were sort of technocratic figures associated with, uh, with Jibril uh, 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 and, and a bunch of opportunists. Um, characteristically, what you see when, when people vote in elections in, 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 in the Middle East is they vote for people they think will deliver them a better future, will deliver them something that actually has material a material impact on their, on their ordinary lives, education, services, blah, blah, blah. There was a period in Egypt in 2011 and 2012 when people were voting against Mubarak and against the Mubarakists, against Shafiq and, and, and the return of Farouk. <coughs> that is characteristic of revolutions, um, uh, especially when you have an expression of the, of the democratic, uh, democratic choice. 
but consistently what you see is a level of support for the Brotherhood expressed electorally and also in polling in most Arab countries of between 15 and 25 percent. Um, this is not a majority, not a plurality. Now, one of the reasons the Brotherhood has been able to maintain that, that to, to attain that level of support, of course, was in Egypt in particular, was Sadat's decision in the early 1970s to release the prisoners that Nasser had put in there after 54, uh, and their acceptance that they would in some sense become an arm of the state in the Sadatist state's conflict with leftists, with Nasserists, uh, uh, with secularists and liberals and so forth. The groups who were suppressed um, in Egypt in the 1970s uh, were not really Islamists, they were liberals, they were secularists, they were leftists. Uh, and we saw that uh, as after, uh, after Mubarak took over from Sadat as well. Uh, essentially, the Egyptian state uh, handed the keys to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the ideational kingdom uh, in, in Egypt uh, to the Brotherhood. And the Brotherhood misunderstood this as a natural trajectory reflecting their own appeal, mass appeal, uh, to Egyptians. And there was that secular moment in, in Arab politics, uh, which was messy, it was corrupt, it was all those sort of things, but it was a secular moment when leftists, liberals, uh, uh, Ba'athists, uh, nationalists uh, dictated the terms of the debate from about Zaglul in 1919 through maybe to Nasser's death uh, in 1970. And that's the moment that people forget that didn't exist. So when Western policymakers think about the Middle East these days, they tend to think that Islamism is the single authentic expression of a political will in the Middle East. And I think that is a big mistake. That tendency is still there. Uh, I think the mood music in Whitehall has changed over the last uh, over the last three or four years. I think the same has happened in the United States, but it's still an area of intense conflict. And of course, we're now seeing this conflict expressed in the way the policymakers argue about what you do about about how you respond to the challenge of, of the Islamic State, of Al Qaeda, of these other more organised, uh, highly violent, uh, very uh, um, kinetic um, uh, movements. Uh, in the Middle East and the impact of that on, on other policies. I don't think that's been, that's been, that's been resolved uh, in any way. I think those arguments continue. Um, I think you see it as well in, in the way that people uh, in the Home Office and elsewhere continue to think about engagement with Muslim communities in this country and the issue of radicalization within uh, the United Kingdom in the same way as you have the same debate to a certain extent in the United States, also in France and Germany. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion about this. And I think at the heart of this confusion is this, is, is this unwillingness to deal, or is this, is this difficulty that policymakers have in dealing with ideological challenges. You can deal with material challenges, you can deal with something that hits you now that needs a response by tomorrow lunchtime. But when you're thinking about ideologies, it's much more difficult to form policies. And I'll finish there.